This is the fourth day of the April 90 seven day retreat at Springwater. A few people have asked me since the whole thing about feelings came up, the mixture of thought and feelings, thought and emotions. A few people have asked whether there are any emotions or feelings not connected with thoughts. For anyone who is interested in such a question, one needs to observe and look deeply, doesn't one? Not just superficially, but watch deeply. Not just take whatever will come out here, which I'm not at all sure about, I don't know yet, not to take that as an answer. Yes, there are feelings which are without thoughts, or no, there aren't. But if at all one is gripped by a question, then that, that helps in observing it, observing oneself. And observing oneself brings attention and a deeper listening. And with attention and deeper listening, the mind that is occupied so randomly and uh, continuously with chattering may slow down or, or go into abeyance on its own because there is a, a listening in the light of a question. Now this can be interpreted as means to an end, let me get a good question, and that will be the supreme weapon against the chattering mind. And this is what we do. And whole schools are founded on such principles, methods. But we're not advocating that. I hope this is not being misunderstood. Are there feelings and emotions without the admixture of thought? Talking with one person about this, uh, we, we came to differentiate in between feelings, emotions very slightly. We didn't occupy ourselves too much with it, that emotions have thoughts in them, thoughts and memories. And we've gone plenty into that, how a line of thought can keep the emotion going, and out of the emotion come more thoughts. I don't like to feel this way, or I am justified to feel this way, or I must control this, or I must express this, or repeating things about what brought on the emotion in the first place, repeating it to oneself, or making reactive statements about him or her who brought on this anger, or remembrance of the situation that brought on the fear, anticipation of further situations in the imagination so more fear is aroused, So it, it looks like in the arousal of emotion, thought, remembrance, imagery play an inseparable part. 
not all of it verbal, because before we learned to use words, there was emotion. At the instance of something happening, the mother turning away, not being back on time, the remembrance of that, or having been hurt or dropped, terrified, the baby, and the remembrance associated with the first instance and so forth that brings on the emotion, fear, anger. So we'll leave that word emotion aside, even though if somebody says, look, there, there, is, a, there is emotion that has not been caused by thought or remembrance, and we'll, we'll look at it. We haven't said the final word about anything. The word feeling can be used in many ways, but at times when one says, I I really feel that such and such is the case by looking at a situation, looking at, looking at someone. That may mean more than just thinking about it, but the whole organism participating in the perception. One can have a strong feeling about a beautiful morning, a fresh morning, the, the light over the eastern hills, the clouds starting to uh, color in hues of pink and orange, red, and blue sky of a blue that is only there in the morning. The freshness and untouchedness of everything. There, there can be, now there are words being used, and that can evoke the feeling, and it can evoke romantic or sentimental feelings. But in looking out the window, or standing in the midst of it all outside, it can be a wordless feeling about the whole thing. And by feeling is meant more than intellectually acknowledging it or verbally describing it, that all need not even take place. It is the total participation of everything in everything, including this organism. And the feeling of that participation, that in-touchness, that could be the, the word feeling could be used for that. The feeling of beauty in, in the light of the morning and the, the, the effortlessness in which the birds glide in and up and down. Beauty just the perception without a sense of choice or judgment. What is there? The rows upon rows of blue hills fading out in the distance. The golden grasses or, or weeds in front. The trees yet without leaves. The silhouette of the branches against this pinking sky, there, there's beauty in that without evaluation and without wanting it, wanting something of it. That in itself, the absence of, of wanting or evaluating trying to preserve it or do something about it. The absence of all of this activity of meanness 
in itself could be felt as beauty, the beauty of everything being there as it is, without interference. Of a wanter or a fearer or a doer or even a seer. It's all there. Without the effort maker. Is, is that a feeling? Or is that word too much already? Feeling. Uh, see, th that's the problem with words. And yet there isn't a feeling of indifference or coldness or apartness. But there are no, there are no words or, or imagery or memory that can be seen. If, if the memory comes up, this reminds me of the most gorgeous morning I experienced uh, last retreat or five years ago in my childhood. Then something extra is added and there can be an extra gush of, of, of energy or good, good feeling. Or beginning to describe to oneself and we're not saying anything of this is wrong or out of place because it happens. Then to just observe what is happening when this takes place. Describing to oneself. And then maybe if one is really very honestly observant, becoming infatuated with one's ability to describe, feeling so good about oneself, about being so good at something. These thoughts can give feelings of energy or organismic well-being, and one can see it comes from the thought about myself or about what this reminds me of, or what I will experience in the future, even more marvelous sunrises when I go to Florida or Colorado into the mountains. So for all by oneself, there can be this observation. Although if we share it with each other, talk with each other about it, or read someone who, is, who comes from, from clarity, not from sentiment or the desire to convince somebody, then th that helps. That helps for some reason in clarifying something. Because there seems to be a real need in us human beings, to put into words, to express verbally what is so hard to express verbally as it takes place. And very often by expressing verbally what is seen to be so or maybe so, some, some more clarity ensues. Mutually clarifying process. The words can be clarified also in talking with each other. Someone saying, I don't quite understand what you mean. And then maybe saying it again or differently, looking for a different word. The, our verbal expression can be clarified by doing it and also looking again. Can be clarified. An amazing thing which is for each one of us to come upon. In, let us say, the feeling of sadness and sorrow is that inevitably caused by thought or as one maybe is a witness to a child being abused, one sees it, 
in the street someplace, in the store, or he is at next door in the house. A mother almost continuously scolding and screaming at crying children. It needs, it needs no thought, it needs no judgment, it brings sadness. utter sadness of what is happening so darkly, and we're using the word darkly to, to denote so ignorantly, so programmatically. Exasperation, screaming coming from uh, one's own background as a mother and one's present situation. And one doesn't see the children as children, one sees them as little devils, little adversaries who just have it in for me, trying to tease me or test my limits. And the children being pounded by words or hands. And the whole past and future all held in this situation. to unfold more at any time. Children against children, or when they grow up, dishing it out to their children. Or people who have less power than they do at the moment. So the, the sadness of that, even though we're right now using words to describe the situation, if it is seen the instant, at the instant it's seen there is a feeling of sadness and sorrow which connects with our whole human situation of acting so blindly, so destructively and so consequentially, with such consequences, with such obvious results. This brings up another question which filled an earlier meeting. Someone reporting that the mind at times in going over what happened, remem remembrances of what happened at work and how one responded or, or failed to respond at a moment and then almost an outcry at what happened. A feeling of guilt, feeling down on oneself, deeply at fault for what one did or didn't do during the day, yesterday, or in the past, when one could have done otherwise, or needn't have done what one did. We, we all know that, don't we? The remembrance of what happened what one did or didn't do, and the pain hitting one instantly, pain of fault, of guilt, of wrongdoing, or wrong not doing. And then very often, 
trying as quickly as possible to forget about the whole thing. Shut it out of the mind. Because this organism spontaneously tries to avoid pain. Evade it. Get out of pain's way. Right now, this morning, with sunshine flooding through the windows, feeling of spring in the air, we will look at guilt. What, what this is all about, this, this feeling of being bad, having done wrong, being guilty. What is that feeling? What is all contained in it? What are all the strands in it? In this fabric of guilt. And I'm looking right now, I don't have it yet. So let's all look together, not just waiting for somebody to say something and then take it in intellectually. I'm not saying that's what people are doing. There's a, a, a great depth of working together here. something so instantaneous about it, isn't it? The feeling, the remembrance and the feeling, oh, I did wrong. And is there in that the fear of punishment? May not be very obvious. One mustn't say, no, no, that's not in there. We'll leave it open, we'll look. Fear of being found out by others for what one has done or didn't do, which means the tarnishing of the image. Others finding out that I am not the way I would like them to think of me. We have great investment in our image of how we want to be seen by others and by ourselves. And the fear that this image now is tarnished or is destroyed. And with that, I myself am damaged. That's the feeling. And the fear of that damage, the fear of how other people will respond to me if they know, or maybe a much deeper program, by deeper I mean more concealed, more hidden from awareness, that even if people won't see or find out, God will. Remember very vividly from my childhood, a little illustrated Bible, Old Testament. I don't remember reading it. I looked at the pictures. That was enough. Adam and Eve hiding, crouching behind a quite transparent bush. <laughs> was much of a hiding place. And God up there seeing them right through that bush. And their fear and their crouch, the, the furtive eyes. No one uh, in my immediate family ever talked about believing in God. I don't remember that, but that book, uh, and maybe uh, other people talked about it, impressed itself deeply upon me. That at that time, that 
no matter where I would hide, God would see me and would find out and would punish me. Because this, this God on that picture, there was nothing loving in that face. And people sometimes bring it up in meeting, half playfully, this, what about this fear of hell? Christian religion has it, Buddhist religion has it. It's a little bit more an endurable hell because it has a duration to it. It's not forever, then one may come up to a higher level again, but <laughs> that may not last either, and down again to a lower level. So is that mixed in there? One, one may say, no, I've, I've put down my fear of God in hell long ago. Don't be so sure. There are depth psychologies that propose or propound that all the mythological and other, all the mythological archetypes, meaning old structures that we've ever thought about, human beings have ever thought about or invented, are deposited in a common consciousness, common collected collective consciousness and operating there. And it's not so hard to, to take because everything that has happened in one's own life is deposited in memory. Everything one has ever thought about becomes some kind of a program that keeps operating or other people around one have thought. We are a, a vast complex, constantly unfolding set of programs which determine our actions, which we think are free. But they are determined, affected, influenced by recent old and ancient programs. One of them is reward or punishment through a God, a higher divinity, a higher being, superhuman powers, and possible landing in hell, in a hellish state, forever, for what one has done. What we're asking here since day one is can programs or clues that pro a program is running come into awareness so that the thoughts or the compulsions are not taken for granted that this is how it is and this is me and this is how it has to be or whatever all the rationalizations are we have for the programs that are running wondering whether this has to, has to be this way, why it is this way, whether it has to continue this way, whether there can be freedom from that. One knows not how, but the question is, we're free to ask. So coming back to guilt, the immediate occupation with fear, dis-ease about a damaged image, how people will react, what maybe higher powers will do, what, one's, what the consequences will be. <coughs> will anybody ever like me again after this? One can listen internally for each one may express itself a little bit differently. But in this occupation now with 
fault-finding, calling oneself names, being down on oneself, through old and new programs. One doesn't really look with some curiosity and openness at what it was that actually happened. As such fear of having done something wrong, having made a mistake that that blurs and takes away from openly regarding, looking at, albeit be through, be through memory, what actually happened, what went wrong. I was so afraid of making mistakes or having, make, having make an, made a mistake the defense or the guilt, and then the defense against the guilt, Rationali rationalizing way or the, the best thing yet to blame somebody else for it, instantly takes over. Rather than leaving it open, maybe I, I made a mistake. Maybe something was really off the mark in what I did or didn't do. And can there be the, an end of this tizziness in the mind that tries to protect and defend and find fault and blame. Do repentance. An end of this chaotic tizziness and stopping and seeing what really took place. Quietly. See whether memory is even available of what actually happened. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but there may be some that could be looked at, that can be reconstructed what happened. And is it possible to see one's action or inaction without fear, guilt, rationalization, without twinging, squirming, running away, sort of relaxing into the fact that this indeed did happen. Why? And not why to find again the reasons, the causes in the past or present, but leaving it open, wondering about it. And in such open openness, which is free of fear of retaliation or self-punishment or self-blame or other blame, in such openness, things may reveal themselves by themselves. The impulse to defend what? What am I defending? And not pressing, not pushing, just allowing it to reveal itself. Me, my, and so forth, my. And not jumping on it, not saying it shouldn't be like this. What, what one is interested in, maybe, is the truth of the matter. What is going on from moment to moment? And if that truth can be seen as it unfolds this moment, really seen, defense of the self, fear of what will happen to the image and the image being an image it's not it, it's not this organism it's just an image or a whole bundle of them then maybe the next time something like this happens 
there will be some clarity to start out with. Because something has been understood and clarified and thinking has been clarified with it. I read something very interesting in a book which I mentioned many retreats, several retreats ago. It's a book by David Bohm and it's called Unfolding Meaning, if that's the correct title, I think it is. And in a discussion that this book is a transcription of, it was mentioned that the word in the Old Testament, the word sin, or the translation, that is a translation from the Greek, refers to a word which in Greek meant missing the mark. In the Greek version of wherever this word appears, this word sin, there is a word which translated into English says missing the mark. But in the Bible, on well, that particular, probably many versions, but the word sin is, it seems to be in every version. There is the word sin, which is heavy. Missing the mark is not heavy. It points to something that is going on, a process. And the word repentance or penitence, which has the word pain in it, originally in Greek was metanoia, which means changing the mind. That's interesting, isn't it? That's quite a difference, isn't it, to, to think and read about there needs to be a change of mind or to say there needs to be penitence, which implies pain. And this is what penitence has been always, doing something painful. And the amazing idea that doing something painful and harsh lying in prison, chained, or being beaten, or whatever, carrying rocks up a hill for 10 years or so, that this would bring about a change of mind. Maybe a certain change of mind where there, something is broken. But it doesn't bring insight. Maybe it does, since insight depends on nothing. Maybe there can even be insight while pushing rocks up a hill for 10 years. I don't know. But can one go with examining where we miss the mark? or where the program that was established before and now runs automatically and affects the action may not hit the mark now. To, to hit the mark now we have to be, we have to look openly, clearly which we can't when there's already the reaction in, in, in process. A reaction coming out of maybe an old program of having gotten hurt and needing vengeance for injury suffered in the past, needing, to, needing vengeance. And when that program runs, we don't see what we hit or whom we hit. We just hit.
So when guilt strikes, fear of wrong, fear of wrongdoing, which has tremendous physical accompaniment, not just in the body, but also in the brain. Thought can't think straight. It's, it's disturbed, jarred. Can there be, at some time or other, a moment of pausing, sitting down with the whole thing, or walking quietly with the whole thing, and allowing this whole thing to unfold? Careful that the involvement in the guilt does not hide what happened, to, to feel free to look at what happened, actually. Or the involvement with the image of oneself, that one doesn't make mistakes. One can't make mistakes. One, one has this idea one is perfect. One wouldn't say this to anybody, but it may be lodged deeply in, in the mind. The fear of imperfection. And therefore, the fear of admitting, yes, I made a mistake. It's marvelous if one is able to do this. Not out of a new defensiveness. It can, it can become a new defensiveness. Of immediately saying, yeah, I, I made a mistake. I make lots of mistakes. And still not looking. What went wrong? What happened? And not jittery to find excuses or find fault. with oneself or others. Allowing some quiet and space and time for revealing or unfolding of how this body-mind in human beings, not just in me, but in human beings, operates in such concealed ways and yet not totally concealed because there can be wonder of wonder, there can be insight into it. If there is this quietness, space, time and the curiosity which is not beset by fear to already want to come out with it, what I did and rationalize it. You see, this opens up the whole polarity that we already touched upon yesterday or the day before, which has beset humankind since time a memorial between good and evil. Personally, I don't think of evil as evil. I want to find out why did a person, if it is a Adolf Hitler, act the way he did? What happened to that mind and body and to all the mind and bodies around them? That things could happen that happened. And what is possible to happen to the mind? To what extremes can it go under the power of thought and program? The revenge program, the hatred program, the enemy program, the purity program or the cleansing program, needing to cleanse mankind of impure people. And this is the power of idea to distort and propel action, to distort perception of people and compel, compel action to eliminate people. It's awesome, isn't it? 
the power of image and thought. And what is also awesome is the potential in the brain for things like violence and pleasure to be contiguous, be together, that due to who knows what happened, violence can be experienced as pleasurable, Sex and violence can be experienced as pleasurable adjuncts to each other. Pain in oneself or causing pain to others can excite a pleasure center in the brain and body. See, none of this needs to be judged or it speaks for itself, doesn't it? What can go wrong? And what it does to human beings, not just the victim, but the victor, One can see at times when one sees violence done to children verbally, physically. What may unfold out of that first, it stays within and then it may come out at any time. Perpetrating what was experienced as a victim on a new victim, as now the perpetrator. So, what is good and bad? Or is there only trying to find out what, what makes possible the horrendous suffering that human beings have brought upon themselves and each other and are continuously doing. And we have these brains. It's not our private, individual, separate, unique brain that is maybe not affectable by all of this. This is the same brain. subject to the same influences and to the same outcome, the same results. Goodness, is there such a thing as goodness which is not in opposition to evil? If the question is raised, what is goodness, is again the first response of the brain to seek a definition. But how, how can one define goodness if, it, if there isn't a feeling for it? as we said in the beginning of the talk, a feeling that has nothing to do with moral standards, ideas, archetypes, images, social pressure.
is a good person, one who is diligently doing good works. It may look that way, working for the poor, for the sick, for the underprivileged, giving one's life. for this work, to do good. And yet, what's the inward state of being? We're not judging, we're wondering. Is the inward state of being one of no self-center that feeds on doing good works, thrives on it in, in a a way just as one thrives on anything that one does to feel good about oneself. Righteous. That's for, for each one of us to look from moment to moment. Where do I ac our actions come from? Not judgmentally, not with guilt or fault finding, but with interest, openness, fearlessness. Allowing to reveal itself whatever is there and maybe as it hits the light of day, meaning seeing it, it loses its power to influence and distort or feed this extra sense of self-importance. We will end here for today.